shook her up, I shook her down. He go away, all the way. I shook her all the way. don't know where that is, but that's all been concreted over now. But uh, that we call that as boys, uh, Jakey's Beach, all right, and the um, the houses, you know where the White House is? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you go a bit further past that, there was a, a little cove, mm -hmm. and that was Jakey's Beach. So that water outlet is still there? It's still there, yeah, yeah but so of course yeah. it was... Is that Brown Spear then? No. Before, before it's yeah. the bottom of the yeah. Queen's Head. So, I mean, that, oh, was, that wow. was basically an open sewer going into the... But, uh, and those buildings, people lived in them, uh, we, we used to call They're that the, uh, the, the, the... My mother called that the back row. Uh, wow. But, yeah, they were all wow. knocked down. Wow. Yeah. yeah. But as yeah. kids, we used to play around there because there were derelict houses as well. It was, it was wow. uh, Aladdin's Cave. Of... That was the back street that led on to... Um, to get to that beach that we've just seen, yeah. and we had a friend who lived right on the end corner there. So they're, they're all knocked. They're all, they're knocked all down. gone. Yeah, yeah, they're all knocked down. Mm -hmm. But I remember as a boy going. We, we, we're often in there because there was all sorts of nooks and crannies and derelict <laughs> boats, and there was an old wife there, and she was smoking a pipe. Oh wow! Yeah, uh, and she had a cap on, you know, an old fashioned <laughs> man. And I got such a fright because I hadn't seen a woman smoking a pipe before, wow. but, but she was. Wow. <laughs> and that's, um, I think that's the old, uh, that's the old back road. You know Front Street? Yeah. Well, that was just behind Front Street. Oh. So that wasn't, but that wasn't the Simpson Street? No. No, so that was, was the Front Street along here where, yeah. where, where, where those new houses are opposite the Queen's Head. Yeah. That was Front Street. But behind it was Back Row. Right. Uh, another set of cottages. And that's where they used to keep their lobster pots. And the rumour was they kept the crabs under their bed and baskets and stuff like that. Uh, my mother used to insist that I'd not go hanging around there. Uh, <laughs> it was a bit rough. Yeah, it was a bit rough. It was, uh, and that, that is the old hut, swimming hut, at the south side of Colour Road, Spain. Well, uh, well, Janet, I think she was a member of the, there was a swimming club in there. Mm. So that's why she's, she's drawn it. Hi, Hi. <laughs> <laughs> It's the 25th. 4th of April 2023, yep. we've just met to hear about your recollections of growing up. Yeah, in the village. Yeah. Um, so if we just start at the beginning, mm. maybe your earliest memory? Well, my earliest memory, uh, funnily enough, is coming here, because my yeah. grandfather had a bad leg. Is that to the watch house? Come to the watch house. Wow. Uh, and through there, there was a fire a stove and all the old gaffers would go in there and play dominoes uh, and smoke pipes and I used to kind of look after him in case he wants because he, he couldn't he wasn't very mobile and he, he liked me with him I think so I have a lot of memories there my other memory of this building is in the winter it was always open because the men were playing snooker and billiards and we used to play Haralevo from here. Do you know what Haralevo is? Well, it's a gang of about, so you have a gang of ten, and another gang of ten. We were all kids in the village, right? So the ten would clear up. It go as far as Rockcliffe, Whitley Bay, and we'd go out and try and find them, and you captured them, and you bring them back here. And so this was the camp, the prison. But if one of their team came and shouted Haralevo against the, the watch house door, they could be released. So these games can, can go on forever. But, but they, they began at the watch house, and the watch house was the... Uh, the other memory I have of this place is on a Sunday from the Fisherman's Mission, they used to sing uh, hymns and stuff, yeah. just outside here. Uh, and people on the beach would come and listen to it. Yeah. And how old were you? I would be uh, about um, four or five when I had my earliest memories. I mean, uh, so I was born in um, 
in Preston Hospital in North Shield, now demolished, in '42. And as her mother said, you were born during an air raid. Hitler would often drop bombs on shields on his way back from Glasgow. <laughs> and they should just get rid of their bombs before they, so they could fly a bit faster. Anyway, so, so, but we always lived in Simpson Street. Um, my mother, parents were fisher folk. And so her, her father lived in 31. So he lived in 15 Simpson Street and we lived in 31. So it was, it was quite a family of us. Yeah. So that brings us nicely to this photograph. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now I never met her because she died 42 years old with pneumonia, yeah. which wasn't uncommon in those days because the fisherwoman would go around the doors and get a good soak in for their troubles. Yeah. Yeah. So who, which one's your grandma? That, that's her, yeah. This lady? Yeah, yeah, yeah Mary, yeah. Mary? Yeah. Mary, yeah. And we don't know the other lady? I don't know who she is, yeah. no. no. So no. do you have any memories of your grandma? No, I never met her. She no, died before. Uh, oh, yeah. 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 What happened was, uh, she died age 42, that she had four sons, uh, and, and Lily, my mother, and of course Lily was like 12, so she was dragged out of school to look after this. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's what happened in those The stories of your grandmother and the fisherwoman, were you talking about those? Not really, as far as I know, she her, her patch was up in Hexham and Corbridge Way, and uh, she um, and she had other relations on the quayside, the Lyles, who, if you were on the North Shields quayside, <coughs> you were wholesaling fish, and that's where the, the big money was. Right. So, uh, my mother used to go and see her family. But she, my mother was always in trouble with money for one reason or another, because my dad was a bus driver, and we didn't have two pennies to remove it. And my dad was on, in hospital for eight months with a heart attack. Uh, and so she went there to get money. And money. She was turned away by that. Anyway, that that's another story. And this fella, I never met him, but he was a, a pilot on the time. On a commercial? Yeah. There were, no, there were pilots bringing in the boats up the time. Right. Yeah. Okay. I don't have them anymore because there's no boats coming up. Yeah. But it, that was a very prestigious job. Yeah. He looks very smart. He looks very smart. He's obviously. And he is who? He's he must be related to my grandmother. I mean, a lot of these pictures my mother collected. So that is that is me in Simpson Street. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> that's oh, a, that's a cute photo. Yeah. <laughs> so you can see what Simpson Street was like. <laughs> but it's pretty tough, <laughs> and that must have been me. Uh, I guess slightly older, <laughs> but still, I guess in Simpson. Is that a school photo? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Yeah. What school did you go to? Well, Colourcourt Primary in John Street. Yeah, yeah, and that was just a great school. I mean, we had a very successful. Um, football team and stuff like that and uh, the way they organised it in those days was <coughs> the crucial thing was to pass the 11 plus so you could go to the grammar school so Collegewoods had <coughs> primary had 4A <coughs> and 4B and if you're in 4A you're pretty likely to pass the 11 plus if you're in 4B you were destined for Link School secondary oh, yeah. modern school and with me, they moved me from 2A to 4A, cut out 3A. So I spent two years in 4A <laughs> preparing to pass the 11 plus. Now, either because I was bright enough to go straight into 4A, or whether they felt I needed two years to pass, <laughs> I have no idea. But in the event, I did pass. I, I did go to the high school. And I've got, uh, I think I've got it here somewhere. Yeah, that's me with my high school uniform on the, oh, wow. on the day going. That was on the Sunday. I, I was going to start the next day. Yeah. And of course, I noticed that they would send you a letter with an elaborate list of things you had to have. And the headmaster, he was called Mr. Cantle. He thought that that design with the yellow edgings was made us look like omelettes, that was his expression. So he, he took away the uh, edgings. And by the time I finished the high school, I wasn't anything 
like that. There was no cap, there was no blazer. I had a tie, but that was it. Being a teenager, you didn't want all that from me. And we used to catch the bus from Station Road to the high school. And oddly enough, the same bus would bring us back for lunch. <laughs> and then back to the high school. Imagine that happening. The high school was in Hoggies Lane, do you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's the building's still there. Oh, it's a fantastic oh, building. Yeah, yeah, it was brilliant. Have you ever been inside it's it? Nice to, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's it's fast. So that was me going to the high school. So what happened there was we did it to, to Penny. So my mother went to see her father, my grandfather, and he paid for my uniform. <laughs> and then after we got that sorted out, we got another letter saying, of course, you have to have all the sports equipment and stuff. <laughs> so I had to get a football shirt, and again, he, he, was, he was fine about it, he paid for that. Did you see much of your grandfather? Yeah, a lot of my grandfather, because he was kind of, he was in the shipyards until he was about 75. Mm. And he should have retired, but nobody knew how old he was, including him. And we didn't know where his birth certificate was, so we knew very little about it. He, oddly enough, came from Surrey. He, oh, I, I think in those that. days, people just travel around the world. Because yeah. there was no dole, you just yeah. you yeah. went where the world was. Yeah. So he ended up here. And, uh, yeah, he... Um, so I used to go and look after him, or sit and watch with him while he watched the telly. That was his... His main thing. So I used to see the most amazing things, you know, like in the early days of BBC, you would get long uh, big, uh, plays of, of Charles Dickens's plays and stuff like that. It was all quite highbrow in those days. So God knows what he made of it, but I used to quite enjoy it. And I used to watch the uh, the tennis. And the great memory of that, this is the 50s now. In the 50s, Newcastle won the Cup three times in five years, right? And uh, we watched it on my grandfather's nine-inch screen. Yeah. And uh, he was the only one in Simpson Street who had a telly to our knowledge anyway. So the, the street would crowd in to, to watch it. And that's where my love for Newcastle as a team came from. Yeah. With this lady here, was there any other connection to the fisher folk or any connection to fishing in Coleco? Not, not, not as far. My father was uh, on the lifeboat for a spell. But, but he, my father was from Yorkshire. So he didn't really have any local connections. He always, to quote him, he always regarded himself as an interloper and uh, felt felt as such. He met my mother sort of during the war and stuff. He lived in lodgings in Nader Street. You know Nader Street? Yeah. yeah. What was his name? Um, Norman, same as me. Yeah, yeah. He, he was a Yorkshireman. What happened there was, I don't know how they did it, but him and his brother Arthur left Keithley in Yorkshire when aged 12 to come up here looking for work. Again, we're talking about the late 20s, early 30s. Right? But he never kept in touch with his brother. His brother went to Leeds and my dad came here. And that's when he took digs in Nader Street. And he worked in the pits. I mean, I God knows what the hell he expected to get far from the pits. He did have a go at the uh, uh, fishing on the trawlers. I always remember him saying to me, I thought I thought the pits were bad until I went to the trawlers. So he didn't do any uh, trawling. So then, did they fish from here? Yeah. No, no. He, yeah, some did. Yeah. But most of them... Uh, fished out with no shields yes. in what they call the uh, sea netters, which are slightly bigger than a coval. But by the time I was allowed down the bay, there was be only be about three or four families. There was the Stocks family and one or two others actually practically fishing with cobals. And I knew a guy called Norman Fairbairn who was the last guy in the village who could actually build a coal. Uh, and you know where the Queen's Hotel is? There's a patch of empty ground there now where they've got boats. Well, he had a, his own place there where he built the boats. And I remember him taking me in as a boy and he showed me he'd just started to lay the keel for a while. I think they still made an amble. 
I just wouldn't call them. <coughs> but there were, there were, there was about four or five on the beach. There were quite a few amateur fishermen, of course, but, but not many professionally, it had more or less gone by then. The fish shop lasted for quite a while though, Mrs. Goddard's fish shop, and that was on the front street. Mm. And that was an old fashioned shop which had fresh fish straight from the quay every day. A great big slab of whatever you wanted, it was, it was always fresh. So we were always, oddly you know, quite well fed because there was a fish shop, there was uh, Lyles, the butcher, at the bottom of uh, I think it was Dove Street. Believe it or not, he used to kill his own animals in the back. Yeah, so if anything, it was fresh. Honestly, yeah, uh, and sweep the blood into the back lane. <laughs> <laughs> it's different times, man. I mean, we're talking about the 50s. By so the end of the 50s, I think he stopped doing that, but he still had a butcher shop. Uh, and they lived in our street, so my mother knew his wife, and, uh, Mrs. Lyle, Alice Lyle, and she was nice. And so every time I w walked past his shop to go to the to primary school, we used to say, "All right, Curly, you call me Curly." I wasn't Curly there again. But I met Lyle's book, and there was another butcher shop, and uh, there was a fish shop, and there was a grocery, loads of grocery shops in Huddleston Street, mm. which is now gone, and there was uh, a bakery and stuff like that. So, uh, as a village, it was quite well provisioned. Yeah, and of course, the Bay Hotel was the centre of the drinking fraternity. Uh, until the Crown Club was built. What about the Newcastle Arms? Do you remember? I remember it, yeah. It, uh, that was opposite the watch house here. Yeah. yeah. And then there was a ship further up. Yeah, yeah. there was a number of pubs there was. in a smaller area. And, and then there was the Queen's. Yeah. So that's where I had my first pint uh, ever in, then, in the Queen's. <laughs> and you know the White House, which is still there? Uh, uh, there was a guy who lived in there, Mr. Usher. Uh, he was a bank manager at Martin's Bank in Newcastle, so he was rich enough to buy that house. And he used to let me and my mate Eddie go in there, and we used to make our lobster pots and things in his backyard. Uh, he quite liked the, the company, I think. You know, he was on his own in that. It's quite a nice... Have you ever been inside it? Quite incredible inside. Oh, God knows who owns it now. Is there a... a the steps a, down to the... To the smugglers... Yeah. Is that yeah. true? Yeah, it's true. The, I've definitely seen it. a tunnel. Yeah, You've been, a tunnel. Um, Have you been yeah. through to the smugglers' yeah, caves? Yeah, as a boy, yeah. 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 I thought it was a yeah, rumor. No, it's true. It's, because oh, wow. they used to smuggle things in in the old days, yeah. wasn't about 17 days in century. And this is a popular landing for smugglers. But that was built by the customs and excise. Yes. So uh, he I knew. was playing both sides. Oh, he was? Right. Yeah. yeah. I wow. heard it was owned by Arkwright, who okay. invented the um, spinning jenny. And that was his summer house. What's a spinning jenny? Oh, it was it? It's a... It's what used for weaving, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, God knows whether that's true. And, uh, but it must have been there when Homer lived here. Homer lived in basically the Bay of Hell. Oh, right. Yeah, that's where he lived. I, I suspect it wasn't a fully grown hotel then, but mm. that's where he stayed. Yeah. So, and that had a little bar, and it also had a hatch where you could go with your jug <laughs> and get your beer and take it home. And our neighbour, Mary Diary, she was a real character. She was born and bred in the village, and she used to take snuff. I always remember that as a boy, her always smelling snuff. And she used to go to the Bay Hotel with her jug and, and get her jug of beer. And you could see her wandering up Simpson Street with her jug of beer, and she'd go back. And guess what, she had a parrot that swore as well, of course. So, so that was... That was Real great. As a, as a, you can imagine as a child, you know, all these characters. You know. And when I was ill, because our house was damp, it was so damp we didn't have any floorboards. So we're all, you know, the fries, chocolate, ice, steel signs that used to put outside the shop. Yeah. Metal sign. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was our floor. Yeah. Wow. And so I used to often go down bronchitis. I had pneumonia when I was a child, but that got compassionate needs because that's what I was going to stop it. So it was tough. And so I was often ill, and Mary would come across and 
read me stories and talk to me and stuff. Yeah, yeah. But because uh, my mother would go out to work, she would go out cleaning along Devil Terrace. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. they think nothing of me. You mentioned lobster pots, making yeah. lobster yeah. pots. What was all that about? Well, we, there, there were enough fishermen to use them, and we we had our own boat, uh, and so we had our own pots. Uh, my mate was Eddie Bell. The Bells were a famous family. They lived right on the seafront above the fish and chip shop. So, but, so there was Eddie Bell, Martin, and Florence, and they were all mates of mine. And Eddie. It was a really nice lad. He and he had his own boat, and uh, he could scull it. And then he decided to put an engine in it, and uh, he put two powerful in it. So when he switched to the engine, the boat was like that. <laughs> it was complete. <laughs> uh, anyway, Eddie was my great uh, mate uh, when I was a teenager. We go go out fishing. There. So we we used to go out. With the pots, and, and, then, and that was always a full time job because you had to go out and see if there's anything in them, you know. And what was the catch like then? It was good, it was good. I mean, you, you know, the rocks, I mean, the sea's that now, so you can see the rocks. As kids, we used to go there get, get lobsters in the rocks and crabs and just get a, a fair size, uh, yeah, yeah, you just get a, uh, a metal stick and hug them up. Yeah. And we used to take them to the marine biology lab. Because often we had our own, you know, we didn't need any more lobsters. Although my uncle, uh, my dad's friend Joe, he used to more or less live off shellfish. He lived in back row. He wasn't having lobsters, he was having crabs. But they used to uh, let us take whatever we found on the rocks into the marine biology lab. And we loved going in there because it had the most fantastic tanks. I presume they're still there. And they would have huge fish in there, fish that you wouldn't normally see just swimming around. And uh, they, had, they would have rescued seals in there, so there was a seal living because they had a big pool inside it. Anyway, we used to take what we called butterfish to them, which were tiny little wee fish that lived in the rocks and the pools on the bay. And if, if we caught them on a good day and they were going out in their own boat, they would give us a ride in their in their boat. So that was that was another great treat to go to uh, the marine biology unit. We didn't associate it with the university. I'm sorry, we were concerned. That's where we took the fish. <laughs> so see, there's some lobster pots there. Oh, right. That's, now that's the old back row. That's behind the, front street. Just behind the front street, yeah. And that's a commercial photograph that, uh, 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 what do you call that, Janet sent me. So, yeah. but, but we were always as kids. My mother convinced me that it was dangerous to hang around there. And just when he came out of the back row and turned right, there was some horse stables, because we had two coal men in the village. There was Dick Hamlin, who kept a horse in a, in a sort of stable, just round the corner from there. And then there was an, uh, uh, another guy who kept his horse, would you believe, in our backyard. Really? Yeah. Random. <laughs> yeah, uh, he was a real character. Now, what was his name? We've gone now. But so, so we lived in Simpson Street, and then at the bottom of our yard. So the yard would be the yard for the four families living in the four flats, and the toilets were outside as well. So it was four families sharing two toilets, and then there was a stable, which is where the coal man kept his. Horse. His horse was a little Shetland pony, right? A poor little thing it was too. Dragged. I mean, he would load two sacks of coal on his car, you know. Poor thing. Anyway, one day, there was a wall between, obviously, his stable and where our our coal house was. But one day, my mother went to the coal house to be confronted by the horse. It had knocked the wall down. <laughs> 
So we had to uh, we had to go and rescue that. She got for quite a fright. I mean, the horse was quite docile. I mean, you can imagine it was probably knackered by the time we got home every day from carrying coal. And of course, the nurse is when the women did the washing, they would put the washing out in the in the, in the back lane. Can you imagine? He would come in with his coal car, wouldn't he? God, God. The arguments. Hey, I tell you, I was coming. I moved up to this sheet. And uh, there was fights going on, you know. There were some, I always remember there was many women who were... And we used to play uh, doors. Football doors is where in the back lanes you have a door, you know, to your back door. So in any back lane there would be four or five doors close together. So doors consisted of you defending your door. Uh, so if you if you conceded six goals, that was your out, right? And often the ball would go over the wall into somebody's backyard. And there was one woman, Pacey, she was called, and she would literally put a knife to the ball if it, it went into her yard. So you didn't mess with them. Didn't mess with women. No, they were hard as nails. I mean, they ran the show, honestly. Yeah. The fishermen would obviously, what were left of them, they would certainly be hanging around here on the on the uh, bench just outside the watch house. And you, you always knew who they were because they were there with their leggings on and their fishermen's guns. And uh, the I knew one or two of them because uh, they, one or two of them uh, were still fishing, and my dad knew them as well. Geordie Lyle and one or two of the stocks, they, they were all fishing. And I used to say to them, uh, "Can you lads swim?" They said, "No, look no." And they pointed to the thigh boots that they wore. They said, "If we go overboard, and these thigh boots fill up. We've got a chance." And so, I didn't know this at the time, but I've been told that the fishermen's guns were to a design for each family, so they knew, they knew who they were when they found them. I, I never encountered any fatalities. The one fatality was a guy on the lifeboat. In those days, the lifeboat was quite a big lifeboat. It was called the Isaac and Mary Bolton. Yeah. His kids we used to love going to see it because it was brass and it was smelled of oil and stuff. And we knew Harry Savison who looked after it. And Harry was a real character. He would swear like a trooper to his kids. And we used to think it was hilariously funny. And he was, he was hilariously funny. Yeah. Good old Harry. Is that when the boat was in the yeah, garage? In there, yeah, yeah, garage. yeah. In the summer, they used to open the door and charge me to go and see the lifeboat. Oh. <laughs> my my grandfather had a friend whose job it was to sit there and take the threat. Oh, <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. Um, so the lifeboat would be pushed out, pulled out first on a rope and then the tractor would get behind it and push it into the sea. That still happens of course, except it's a much lighter boat. Uh, anyway, there was a man whose job it was, was to sit on the front of the tractor and then couple the lifeboat away from the tractor mm -hmm. before it turns its engines on. Yeah. Well on this particular occasion it turned its engines on before he he was away from the front and it literally sliced his leg off. Do you know what Heather was on about that? Is that right? She remembers. Does she? I do. Yeah. She talked about it and said yeah. she never knew what happened to the man. Oh, I don't. I think he died. I think he died in the accident. Right. Yeah. Oh, okay. He lived in Simpson Street. Right. Yeah. I knew his son there, uh, Kirkbride. Billy Kirkbride. And we rushed to the beach because your mother says it's been a dreadful accident, you know. And I'm not joking, I mean, it, the beach was covered in blood, you know. They must have tried to do their best to. But I, but I, th I think he died on. So I, either of shock or loss of blood. Or so I, I remember that as a fatality, but there weren't any drownings apart from when the lifeboat was 
founded on the North Pier at uh, Time Out. You, you, you did some photographs recently on the waves crashing into that pier. Well, that's, it's a very dangerous thing because they swirl, the waves swirl back and they were strong enough to even overturn the light bulb. And there was a there was a memorial service this morning. Was it really? At yeah. nine o'clock. Yeah. And it was about the boat going down. I think yeah. it was six feet on it. That's it. Yeah, it was six. Yeah. So that must have been. Yeah, my dad had a mate on there. Yeah, mm. yeah. But that that was a great sad event. Mm. But generally speaking, most of the fishing was safe enough for the general Yeah. Um, we used to also, for our least fishing, we used to do a lot of mackerel spinning as kids now, so we had access to a rowing boat, and mackerel will bite on anything, you don't need a bait, you just have to have a silver paper with a hook attached and they'll, they'll as long as you're moving the boat, they'll go. So, we used to charge two and six to take people out mackerel spinning. <laughs> Very resourceful. Well, they would come out of the Bay of Tell half drunk, you see. Wanting for something to do, which always take your mantle spin. Any other activity that you were involved in as a team? Not really. I mean, most of it for us as boys was informal, just playing football, literally till the tide came in, or playing on the rocks. There was the annual blessing of the boats <laughs> from the Church of England, from St George's Church. I don't know if they do that anymore. But in the middle of summer often, they would have this weird procession, you know, with the vicar and all that, you know. The fishing boats or the lifeboats? No, fishing boats. Oh, okay. All the boats in the village. Yeah. It would end up here, but yeah, it was the annual blessing of the boats. Yeah. And that, my mother um, ended up going to St. George's Church. I say ended up because we went to the fisherman's mission. I mean, I went there to the Sunday school till I was 15, whether I liked it or not. I didn't like it, but I was sent there. That was what I did. But when my mother was ill, they didn't. And she was ill for a long time. And nobody from the fishermen's mission came to see her. And she was quite upset about it. And, but the one person that did come to see her was a guy called George Chadwick, who was the vicar at St. George's Church. Now, he was the old fashioned vicar, a bicycling vicar, you know, really nice guy. <laughs> so my mother said, right, we're going to St. George's Church now. Yeah, why not? Yeah, and so I uh, I was confirmed in the church. I used to go to the vicarage for my confirmation lessons. Yeah. My, my funny story about that. I, at the end of the lessons, uh, at the very end of it, it took like a year to pre be, be prepared for confirmation. Then I went up to St. Nicholas's to, and the Bishop of Newcastle would consecrate you and all that. Anyway, the big little big at George, he said, normally he said that, you did you know, you did quite well on this confirmation. He said, um, have you ever thought of the church at all? <laughs> because I hadn't. <laughs> so, so I thought about it for a week and I thought, well, hang on a minute, that's a tiny job, don't I? You, you, you only work on his side. But, um, Lovely. I said, I said no. <laughs> Absolutely lovely hearing all these yeah, yeah, stories, it's, it's, particularly about all the fishing. And all stuff. the fishing, yeah, 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 it was brilliant. Fascinating, fascinating. Uh, it is, yeah. So if you could sum up growing up in colour culture, yes. what would be your everlasting memory or just... Just the overall thing is the fact that your children don't have that kind of childhood anymore. We were never in the house. We were in the winter. We were chasing around here. Uh, oh, in the summer we were on the beach. Yeah. Summer came, and mother would buy me a pair of baseball boots for two and six from Woolworths, <laughs> and that's that was me through the summer. <laughs> <laughs> and then it literally dropped up your feet. <laughs> yeah. So it's only as you grow older and you start talking to people. Like I talked to people at university about where I came from, and they just couldn't believe it, you know. And and Janet's the same now. She reflects back on her childhood. As a girl, even she was allowed, you know, to play out on the beach, mainly with her girlfriend. The other thing I was a great memory was building bonfires, bonfire nights. So we had a bonfire on on the boat field, mm -hmm. 
and sometimes we'd have a bonfire in the cave. You know the caves? Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes we'd have both because it was a big deal to go and collect all the stuff, and there were there were, there were loads of boats that we could we wanted to get rid of. But the big problem was, you know, Knott's Flats. Mm-hmm. Well, the Knott's Flats lads, they they were notorious, and they had their own bonfire, and it was quite competitive. So they would come and pinch her. <laughs> yeah. So so we would lie in the boat field waiting for them, you know, because <laughs> it was it was tall grass then, you know. So we'd spend you know a good two or three months. And stay off school to protect the bonfire. So that was a big deal, you know, bonfire night. So all this Halloween stuff being started in the bay. So, so, so the ritual of the bonfire, I remember that. Uh, the, the boats, and just generally hanging around the boats, you know. Uh, and, me, and me not being able to swim and nearly drowning, I have a memory of that. Uh, I was in this kayak, and it was meant to be a two-man kayak. And I, I paddled it out, out of the bay. Uh, into the open sea, really. And my mate Eddie, who I mentioned earlier, he came out in his boat and said, I'll tell you what, Norman, he said, I'll join you in the kayak and we'll paddle, because there's going to be a two man I said, okay, like an idiot. And he stood on the side of the kayak and it just flipped. So that was me. So obviously, I did swim because I went down the way and then I must have swam to get back up to the surface. So I have a memory of that. And I'd, I was terrified of going home because I was soaking wet. And my mother would have killed me. And so I just sat on the end of the pier there all day getting dry. <laughs> well, thank you so much. That's all right. Absolutely yeah. fabulous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. ever so much. Before I leave the piers, the, 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 for the good swimmers, they would swim from the South Pier to the North Pier in the, in the summer. And all the Bell family were good swimmers. And in the days the, when the swimming pool was open, they would enter the galas and win all the, all the races before they stupidly filled that pool in with time. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, that was me. Heave away, haul away. I shook her all about the town. We're bound for South Australia.